let me first of all say how delighted we are to be actually launching the book um, that because Anki says for, for COVID reasons she hasn't managed to have a proper launch in, in person yet so we're, we're delighted that we've got the launch um, and I don't really need to introduce Anki she is uh, very well known uh, to everybody here but also well outside modern uh, we are very proud of our professor of uh, English and world literature um, and she's also well known to uh, generations of modern students for her wonderful teaching and uh, as you can see from the number of people on the line from many countries uh, how, uh, how, how much affection she is held in. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the book except that I, I spent the weekend reading it. It is a really a wonderful, wonderful read even for a non-expert, um, a fascinating breadth um, which uh, we're going to explore in the next half hour. Um, but I'm really delighted to welcome two close friends of Anki's. Um, first of all, Dr. David Russell, who is fellow and tutor in English at Corpus uh, here in Oxford. Um, he has fairly recently, two years ago, I think, published a book called, with a wonderful title actually of Tact um, on, on essays, the essay form in 19th century uh, British literature and is working on another book at the moment. I'm sure he'll say a little bit more about that, but covers the romantic period to the present in his teaching. So we've, we've got a, an extraordinary spread because um, alongside him is, is our second guest. Uh, we're absolutely delighted uh, that, uh, that we can welcome back Dr. Natalia Din Karayuki, um, now at Warwick University. Um, she is an expert on 16th and century, 16th and 17th century, uh, uh, literature, so um, uh, very relevant for, for Wadham in particular, um, has already, uh, is, is working on a book which she may say a little bit about, um, but is also working on another book on, on migration, which we were just talking about before we came online, which she, she might also want to mention. Um, and uh, indeed, David may want to say something about his forthcoming book. So uh, books are a great celebration, but we have one actually here, um, uh, and that is An Anki's Extraordinary uh, Unseen City psychic lives of the urban poor. And the way we thought we would structure this is to ask our, our two our guests to speak for a, so five or 10 minutes each, and then for Anki to respond. And then as usual at these events, we'll open it up for everyone for the last sort of 20, 25 minutes, and we promise to stop and let people go uh, on time. So without further ado, um, let me hand over first to David. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, and um, over to you. And then we'll, we'll hear from Talia. So thank you very much, David. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Anki, for the chance to celebrate your book. Um, I've got a few remarks, particularly about psychoanalysis. So I'll set off. Reading Anki's fascinating book, I was reminded of observation by the 20th century British psychoanalyst, Donald Winnicott, about what it is that Freud, with his invention of psychoanalytic therapy, had really invented. On the one hand, psychoanalysis is famously a technique of interpretation. With the right training, the therapist may analyze the seemingly inconsequential details of a patient's life, the slips of the tongue, their dreams, or inexplicable symptoms, and give them a meaning, a meaning which would reveal something hidden about the patient's inner self, their personal history, desires, and traumas. By extension, although this was always a more fraught project for Freud, cultures and societies could be analyzed in similar ways, reading the outward signs of the culture for their inward meanings. This model of psychoanalysis as interpreter and patient or culture as subject matter to be interpreted has of course been much critiqued and for good reason. The scene of interpretation, critics are quick to point out, is often a scene of power by which a set of norms of health and illness, normality and deviancy, is imposed by one subject, usually wealthy, white, male, cis, heterosexual subject position, upon another who may be none of those things, and more broadly by one culture over another. Such is the force of this critique of the power of interpretation by thinkers like Franz Fanon, who Anki writes about in her book, that the idea of applying psychoanalytic thinking across cultures has for some time now seemed at best passe and at worst actively harmful. So it's worth considering the point made by Winnicott, who appears along with an astonishing range of thinkers and voices in Anki's book. Winnicott suggested in the 1950s that to focus on psychoanalysis as a practice primarily of interpretation is sometimes to miss the point of what psychoanalysis is for. This is because 
the invention of psychoanalysis by Freud could be divided into two parts. The first part is the interpretation that I've mentioned. The material presented by the patient, says Winnicott, is understood and interpreted by the analyst. But the second part, says Winnicott, is that what, what he calls the setting in which the work is carried through. The setting of psychoanalysis, Winnicott remarks, has been more rarely attended to, but it really was quite an innovation on Freud's part and rather a complex one. Winnicott asks us to consider how revolutionary was Freud's invention of a clinical setting for therapy, which consists of both a place and a time. In other words, a kind of environment in which the analyst meets the patient to talk with them about their life. This environment is unlike others in the world. For in this situation, Winnicott explains, the therapeutic effect of psychoanalysis does not derive only from the analyst having interpretive answers. It derives also from the fact that, to quote Winnicott, the analyst is much more reliable than people are in ordinary life. On the whole punctual, free from temper tantrums, uh, from compulsive falling in love, etc. So unlike in the world outside, the strangest things can be thought and said in this environment without the person one conveys these thoughts and feelings to, becoming too disturbed or taking them too personally. In the psychoanalytic environment, Winnicott explains, quote, the absence of the talion reaction can be counted on. And what he means by this term talion, he's referring to the Old Testament, the principle of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So he's describing an environment in which there isn't immediately any retribution imposed on someone for the things they think, say, or do. And he describes at least half of what Freud invented as a therapeutic provision of a place and time, maybe just an hour once a week, where people do not have to be afraid of one another in the usual ways. In other words, a world, however small and temporary a world, where there is no retribution. So to put it another way, psychoanalysis reminds us something we need continually to be reminded of, that the environment matters. Now, this is the brilliant proposition at the heart of Unseen City, to place the question of the environment as a psychic fact fully at the heart of an inquiry into modern urban life. In the process, it elegantly evades without ignoring the familiar critique of psychoanalysis as a method of interpretation in order to open up in new and fascinating ways the potential of its environmental logics and how they might be rewritten by global therapeutic practices. From its analyses of therapeutic garden projects in London to the eco-urbanism of characters in Aminata Fauna's novels to the fantasies that attach themselves to the figure of the slum in Mumbai, Unseen City explores how crucial are created environments to the fostering or diminishing of human flourishing. And in the course of its attention to environments, Anki's book calls for a new vision. Unseen is an adjective with a usefully indeterminate sense of the active or passive state, connoting both unthinking obliviousness and more determined looking away. The book makes the case that only a wide angle of attention is capable of confronting what has often gone unseen in thinking about mental life in a globalized world. It proposes that any more just vision of what psychoanalysis may have to offer modern times must begin with the very constituencies who have been overlooked, for whom psychotherapy has seemed most irrelevant or unnecessary a luxury, with the most disadvantaged and most overlooked in urban communities. Unseen City is vastly impressive in its wide ranging attention to urban environments on three continents organized as it is by sections on London, Mumbai, and New York City, and also in its extraordinary range of attention to genre, from novels to films, to fieldwork, to history, to psychogeography, an attention which allows these very different forms and practices to illuminate one another without ever reducing one to the terms of another. Of all its wide range of genres, I'm gonna conclude my comment with some remarks about the book's attention in particular to literature. Unseen City approaches a number of novels and essays about what we might loosely call mental health and which represents the lives of psychiatrists or therapists and those who need the help. In its readings of contemporary authors as diverse as Aminata Fauna, Teju Cole, Ravi Haj, Catherine Boo, Unseen City identifies a literary tradition able to question the often too quickly determined relations and boundaries between suffering and trauma, illness and unhappiness, individual and collective psychology. In the process, the book does not stop 
uh, pointing out the inadequacies of applying Western psychiatry and the psychoanalysis that's all but left behind to, a different, to different cultures. It proposes the more urgent and creative task of asking what would have to happen to our models of psychological care in order to make them more humane, more just, and more useful to urban populations around the world. Anki's book is most fascinating to me when its criticism is able to show that the texts it analyzes are not just about mental health, offering mimetic representation of therapists and sufferers across the world, but also showing us something through their formal qualities. So for example, we're shown in Catherine Boo's Behind the Beautiful Forevers, how paratactic clauses as they pile up perform the exceeding of tenacious fantasies held about Mumbai slums and their residents. And in Amanata Fauna's Happiness, how focus on surprising interconnections in the novel are enabled by its own structures of coincidence and narrative form in order to show the disavowed relations between different classes and spaces hidden in contemporary London. Unseen cities interleaving of these fictional and journalistic accounts of cities with case histories of therapeutic organizations is highly suggestive. Anki's book reminds us that the shared principle of literary criticism and psychoanalysis at their best is a careful listening to the individual case and only then building up the frameworks of general conclusion. Through its careful excavation of our global present, the book leaves us, to paraphrase Anki's description of Fauna's novel, with an approach to questions of justice, which if not a happy one, is at least hopeful. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, and with apologies, I should have said at the beginning, this is being recorded for the benefit of uh, all those who can't make it uh, tonight. But thank you for that uh, introduction. And now I'm going to pass over to Nat Natalia. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Robert. And um, thank you to Anka for the occasion to speak about her wonderful book. Um, uh, yeah, so it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be involved in, in celebrating this brilliant work. Experience of reading Unseen City, in fact, reminded me of what you talked with Anki were like. It's intellectually challenging and exciting. It's able to move deftly from the smallest of textual details to a consideration of the broader cultural and political structures of which those texts and those details are part. Its definition of the literary is expansive. As Anki puts her afterward, drawing on Du Bois, the book's understanding of the literary stands for the ability to take a second look. Unseen City is committed to demonstrating the capacity of the humanities to help us to look at the world differently, to make the invisible visible, the unseen seen. By looking at the world differently, Unseen City argues, we can start to transform it. So I want to comment briefly on a few aspects of the book that stood out most to me. One of the most striking things about Unseen City is the ambitiousness of its interdisciplinary approach. In it, Anki brings the literature, psychoanalysis, and critical philosophical theorizing, as well as empirical study, psychoanalytic, and psychiatric practice, the afterlives of, of Freud's free clinics. Unseen City ranges from discussions of theorists, including Marx, Judith Butler, and Paul Gilroy, examinations of NGO reports, DSM entries, and case studies, to original interpretations of literature, photography, film, and more. What's striking is not only how elegantly Anki navigates this often very dense material, but also how she reveals unexpected and illuminating connections between them, um, between these seemingly unrelated discourses and texts. Far from simply noting the affinities between literature and psychoanalysis, Anki goes further and stages a confrontation between them. She makes use of, as she puts it in her introduction, literature's instrumentality in uncovering and challenging cultural determinants, and in doing so offers an important critique of classical psychoanalysis. In particular, Unseen City reveals the ill fit between the protocols and practices of psychoanalysis and the needs of poor and migrant populations. It offers several examples of case study, studies revealing that ill fit, where the analyst fails to achieve transference. Often this has to do with language, with the failure of the analyst to communicate properly with those under their analysis. Unseen City also shows the ways in which psychoanalysis is implicated in the neoliberal and imperial mechanisms through which those populations are oppressed. But Anki doesn't want us to do away with psychoanalysis altogether. On the contrary, she makes a case for its continued relevance and resonance. If the book puts pressure on psychoanalysis and uncovers its conceptual tensions, 
and contradictions and social and political shortcomings, it does the same for literature. The book studies of literary depictions of poverty and mental health help us to see the limits of received ideas about literary genre and form, the ways these ideas might result, uh, might result in distorted representations of poor and migrant people or erase them altogether. The works of narrative nonfiction studied in this book question, as Anki puts it, the social purpose of the novel form with its generic commitment to class P, the redistribution of wealth and justice and its historical fidelity to equivocal forms of national belonging. Along similar lines, I think, Unseen City interrogates some of the categories we use to taxonomize literature by showing that a category like diaspora fiction, for instance, isn't always able to capture the complexity of the practices and experiences of migration and dispersed populations. In other words, Unseen City shows that the proper description and understanding of the psychic lives of the urban poor requires the reinvention of literary form. His discussion of this formal inventiveness of contemporary literature includes thinking both at the level of genre, as in the critique of the novel form that I mentioned, as well as, in some cases, on the level of syntax, as in her discussion of Catherine Boo's work Behind the Beautiful Forevers, where she considers the significance of Boo's use of parataxis and the connection between this very specific grammatical strategy and the fragmented social structures and psyches that Boo describes. The second aspect of Unseen City that seems especially valuable is its consideration of the ways in which psychoanalysis is embedded in its courses and practices of colonialism, both in terms of the historical conditions um, under, through which psychoanalysis emerged, the colonial and racial implications of its conceptual framework, such as Freud's writing on the primitive um, and on civilization, and in the ongoing acts of colonial and imperial domination in which it is implicated, including forms of biopowers, like zoning, segregation, and border policing. One of the most hard hitting parts of the book, I think, is on discussion of Kashmir and the work of the Indian filmmaker Sanjay Kuk, because there we really see the entanglement of psychoanalysis and ongoing colonial violence. But as ever, Anki's thinking about the relationship of psychoanalysis to colonialism is complex. She shows, for instance, that Freud sometimes places himself in the position of the colonizer and sometimes in the position of the colonized. And she suggests that psychoanalysis um, ways in which psychoanalysis could be rehabilitated for the purpose of colonial interpretation. The final thing I wanted to mention, which is related to what I've said already, is the contribution that the book makes to our understanding of migration and the migrant experience. Um, and I was especially taken by the structure of Unseen City in, in the way it sort of enacts the procedures it describes. And that is because although the book focuses on three key cities, London, Mumbai and New York, it repeatedly calls attention to the connections between these cities and many other places. As we move through the book and through these three cities, we also travel elsewhere, um, to Lagos, to Kashmir, for example, and more. The book also offers brilliant insights into psychogeography, the relationship of the psyche to space, to urban infrastructure, and to the psychic power of acts of walking, of wandering, of rambling. Um, it's a book about psychoanalysis on the move, and it occurs to me that it's a book that also emerged out of movement in, in Anki's travels to the various free clinics that she studies. And so what I want to end by asking Anki is a question, I suppose, uh, to do with the psychogeography of the migrant experience. Uh, so, you know, Anki, of course, you, you're mostly you're focusing on cities and on the kind of structure of the city itself. And so I suppose my question is, how, how would you characterize the psychogeography of the border? What do you see happening um, in sort of border zones? And a, yeah, a related question, I suppose, is uh, could you comment on, on your experience of travel and the fact that, as I, as I said, you did write this book on the move uh, through doing these empirical studies of free clinics? Um, that, that's it for me for now. Well, thank you very much, Natalia. Um, at your opening remark about our extraordinary tutorials with uh, Anki Busby <laughs> is, I think, will have resonated because the breadth is extraordinary, including as you say, the geographical reach. Um, so I wonder if I could now hand over to Anki uh, to respond to those two uh, sets of thoughts and, and also to answer Natalia's question and to go anywhere you want. So over to you, Anki. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, it's a daunting task to uh, live up to you know these these extraordinary uh, minds that you know we had that that have had the very good fortune of 
uh, coming across in my life. I wanted to start by thanking you, Robert, for taking the time to not only host this, but read the book and for the for the great sort of hospitality and the the home that is Wadham College and, you know, Julie Haig and the uh, development office. I want to thank the all the all the all the alumni, the listeners, my colleagues and friends, my students who are here, because it's exactly the kind of environment that that uh, um, uh, David mentioned that that is extremely conducive and productive of um, of experimental thinking of you know thinking outside the box. The box has to be comfortable for you to think outside the box sometimes, and it's a very sort of you know loving, nurturing home for me. So thank you. And I really wanted to thank uh, uh, Natalia and and David for their extraordinarily. If this were a therapy session, I'd say they're returning my truth to me in a, in words that I didn't that I didn't realize. You know, so it's there is definitely that sense of estrangement when I see these these uh, people whose teenage faces I remember. Uh, and sorry to sound patronizing here. It's not coming from a place of uh, patronage. It's coming from deep affection and respect. Um, uh, but I really feel that they are they are sort of really the the readers I was I was writing this for. Um, there's something that you asked me, Robert, and I want to start with that. You asked me what made me want to write on psychoanalysis in the first place, and um, I did my uh, PhD on the history of hysteria in Victorian melodrama. And when I when that became a book, you know, when it became a book called Aesthetic Hysteria, um, uh, an uncle on my mother's side and an aunt on my father's side asked if the book was about them. So the, this is the kind of family background of emotion management that I come from that I do think has had something to do with, you know, this idea of kind of, you know, occulted mental states, histrionic disorders. Um, and, and of course, you know, Victorian melodrama was an extraordinarily interesting um, a kind of, you know, thing for me to read uh, as, as a graduate student, both in terms of, you know, the kind of figurative language it used, and also in terms of emplotment, you know, leading from um, this 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 kind of the triple movement between the introduction of a an emotional problem, the entertainment of the emotional problem, and then the cure, which often involved you know the murder of the hysteric or flinging her out of a window. So I was very interested in that. I almost became a psychoanalyst when I had a very difficult PhD, and I thought I'd train as a psychoanalyst. Um, but around the around the same time that you know I was finishing my PhD, I also felt a disconnect, as if I simply did not. I was the wrong race probably the wrong class, probably the wrong um, uh, kind of you know, gender to be participating in the in the discussions that were uh, sort of galvanizing clinical psychoanalysis. And around this time, you know, when I was kind of wondering, uh, uh, dwelling on my own ambivalence about um, psychoanalysis, I read about, you know, a, a wonderful book by Elizabeth Danto on the free clinic movement, you know, this kind of culmination of the social democratic moment where Freud is um, thinking about um, again, you know, he 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 defined psychoanalysis as a secular ministering of souls, and he's thinking about you know how necessary and how life saving it is for the poor person. It's as life saving as surgery, he says in the in the kind of you know Budapest uh, conference in 1918. And of course, you know, this becomes a speech act, and free clinics become a kind of mental health cooperative movement. So you know it. I start. I wanted to tell that story when I started writing this book. I thought I would talk about, you know, the there is there is enough on what happened in Europe with the free clinic movement, but there wasn't enough about, you know, what happened in Latin America. There there wasn't, you know, enough. At least I felt I felt unsatisfied that there wasn't enough for what, how it went to India or what was happening in New York. So I thought I would tell the stories of all the other places of, outside of Europe where the free clinic movement had traveled. But this is where, you know, something uh, Natalia said about the traveling theory aspect of Unseen City is it became a different book as I started on my kind of, you know, naive questioning of where is psychoanalysis in India. So, you know, in a way, to some extent, the book is also there as this Rolodex that take these contacts, if you will, and go and do better work than me. Uh, but I have tried to outline how I met each person along this journey. And this was a journey. It's not just a journey. It, it was a kind of very non-destinational uh, uh, journey, as you know, we used to read on, on menus of Wagamama, non-destinational eating. It was very non-destinational. I didn't really know where the book would take me. But I was, I was kind of, you know, started talking to 
anthropologists and urban geographers working on slums. Then someone said, you know, I know the psychiatrist in Bangalore who uh, was, you know, a psychiatrist, not a psychoanalyst, but post his cancer treatment, he really believes in talk therapy. So this is how, how kind of, you know, in a way, accidental, and this is how um, almost miraculous the connections were. And, you know, all I had was a set of questions. All I had was my close reading skills, my sort of in a, in a way integrity as a scholar. And at every juncture, for every door I knocked, I expected a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist to say, just go home. Seriously, you have no idea what you're doing. But they didn't. And this is one of the things I wanted to you know kind of address that I think in my questioning, they were also thinking, because most of the people I was talking about, talking to, were uh, community psychoanalysts, people who really wanted to do something. Um, so they were, you know, uh, William Allenson White uh, Institute, this wonderful institute on the Upper West Side, um, trained uh, psychoanalysts who wanted to go into Harlem, or they were, you know, trained by the Indian Psychoanalytic Institute and wanted to go into the field of, you know, mental health rights as human rights, or they were Tavistock trained, um, you know, psychotherapists who were trying to really squeeze into the more evidence based medicine protocols that were now encouraged instead of psychoanalysis. So these short term CBT type treatments, they were trying to, in a way, um, coax into these kind of, you know, short term models more interpretive paradigms, longer time, longer sort of in a way kind of a concatenation of cause and effect. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, I want to kind of like, you know, really take now kind of like address some of the things that David said and, and Natalia said, I will keep this short because I'm dying to hear uh, your questions, but I just wanted to give you this this uh, kind of uh, background to Unseen City. One of the first readers of the book said that it, it felt like it, was cinematic, and I don't think it was meant as a compliment. It it simply meant that I had kind of you know really lost my marbles, and I was kind of you know rambling a bit. Um, but to some extent, that is a good that is a good characterization that I was being led by the evidence. I was being led by the truth of the stories. I did not exactly have an agenda with the book. I did not think I was going to write about the psychoanalysis of the poor. I mean, I've, I come from a country where the inequality is such that to call somebody a poor is almost a curse. It's almost to say you are the deficit model. You did not work hard enough or you are not, you know, I mean, so it's it's so even the, the, the very term carries opprobrium, you know, and I, I don't think that's what I set out to do. Um, I want to kind of like, you know, pick up on um, some of the things that uh, and uh, that that you know David said, and they, these are extraordinarily nuanced comments. I mean, I'm a huge admirer of David's own work on psychoanalysis, and one of the things he said about the setting of psychoanalysis. And you're absolutely right that you know I was actually uh, kind of you know coming to it from Freud, not so much Winnicott. The Winnicott was extraordinarily helpful for for understanding the horticultural project, but it's it's. But that was kind of my question that, and this is something, you know, Anne Anlin uh, Chen Cheng says in her book, uh, Mel Melancholy of Race, that it's not so much a question of why or why we can use psychoanalysis, but why we already do. Why do we use psychoanalysis? And one of the answers she gives is that, you know, it's not just because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just because it's political, not just because it came up in, you know, anti-Semitic or, as I said, social democratic Vienna, um, but because it's also sort of, you know, very good at understanding, you know, that the dynamics of the individual in relation to class, race, gender, co the colonial imagination, etc. Um, it's very good on the intrasubjective, you know, what I call, you know, different circuits of transference and it's 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 kind of in a way haunted by history so for me you know i mean this work uh, from time to time you know i had to really uh, sort of go home and scream because you simply feel do i stop coloring my hair do i stop buying a nice bag do i give away all my money to because the kinds of iniquity you see at that intersection of poverty and mental health is something that makes you question the the tremendous sort of you know a uh, kind of um, network of privileges um uh, that 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 brought me to write the book there in the first place and 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 to some extent i i really felt that in the garden for instance that that um 
that um, David mentioned, you know, this is St. Mary's Garden in Hackney, where a couple of um, Turkish psychotherapists, they do a horticultural therapy with, with women who are who have no English and who have been shunted from GP to GP uh, simply because they were not able to articulate their 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 um, problems. And here, these these women whose past is, you know, they were daily wage laborers in Turkey, um, and they, their language is primarily transactional. They find their they find their kind of you know purpose in in kind of working with their hands, growing crops, cooking them, to, in 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 wiping away another person's tear, or you know kind of like finding some sort of community. So I, I really found this this beautiful cog this beautiful sort of in a way coming to terms with history and this i felt that that beautiful garden was haunted by history much as psychoanalysis is and it was really showing us ways in which you know this kind of sustained um you know kind of uh, attention to another person's cultivation of self could happen you know cultivation both in the horticultural sense but also in the psychoanalytic sense and it could happen without words so it's not the usual you know talking shop that we see so this is a, a peculiar and a very singular setting of psychoanalysis where the talking talking shop is happening without without words and uh, to kind of you know in a way go back to um natalia's uh, and this is something i feel i feel that you know one of the states i talk about you know natalia mentioned you know the the kind of you know the formal attention the 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 paratactic phrases that i note in boo and um i do think that to some extent in the aminata fauna chapter i describe this this kind of 19th century dissociative disorder called the fugue state 18th 19th centuries charles dickens was very taken by it. there are lots of lots of kind of you know novels that have these fugue or in between states i think my mode of writing the book was a fugue state where i was kind of you know constantly negotiating the penumbra of my own ignorance about about you know as i said what i call the psychic lives and i was ignorance because you know to some extent really um we are all products of you know that understanding of poverty and this is something george simmel said in 1965 that poverty is a social relationship it's not merely it's not merely the lack of material means we need the poor to be there for ourselves to feel middle class or for ourselves to feel affluent or for ourselves to feel like the philanthropist or the you know for to to occasion top-down charity so i i really i i forced myself to go into that kind of a not a telescopic vision not the bird's eye view not the you know um the estate developers kind of you know view from the top of the side skyscraper but a paratactic you know paratactic view and these fugue states these in-between states between knowing and unknowing and also unlearning you know so um, uh, I, I i really hope if that has come across in my book i'm i'm very happy because that's kind of where um, that's one of the main ways in which I wanted to kind of uh, really depict, you know, these cities with all their uh, homeless and homesick um, uh, populations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anki. Um, uh, can I, at this point, just, we've got a few minutes uh, for questions. So invite anyone, please, to either put a question in the chat or to raise your hand, your virtual yellow hand or your real hand, whichever you prefer. Um, and Anki is very happy, and I know uh, Natalia and David too, to take questions on anything actually to do with English in Oxford. So it might be about um, Anki's other work on the curriculum and uh, uh, colonialism and anything you want to ask about or Natalia's work or David's. So um, please don't feel uh, you have to ask about anything in particular. But I, I, I we should start with uh, with where you, you finished uh, Anki, and I, I just wanted to ask a question. I mean, you you already touched on why why psychoanalysis and your your passion for it. Um, the, you you mentioned the college at the start as a kind of um, the box in which you 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 were able to develop this. I'm very interested because and the, the fugue the fugue state's not something I'm very familiar with, and I thought that is a, a it is a, a, a wonderful concept. There's a kind of stream of consciousness side to this book, um, cinematic as as you said. Um, what strikes me from our history is it's impossible when you read the book to tell, unless you know already, what discipline you're in, actually, which is wonderful, actually. It's a sort of uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach to life, which are without boundaries, which I, I thought was, was wonderful and very inspiring. The second thing about it for, for me was the extraordinary sense of 
uh, social uh, mission and passion. Um, you don't necessarily expect in a, a work on English literature, um, your, your advocacy for psychoanalysis, for example, uh, in a certain type of psychoanalysis, um, and your, your approach to social justice and poverty, as you just mentioned. Um, I, I wonder, um, I don't know where you've responded to all that, but I, I think on, the, on the, the mission side of this, do you see your role as a professor of English to, to change the world, to have an impact? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean that trivially. I mean, do you see that? Do you see it as com compatible with your your academic life to to try to change things? I mean, I definitely want the humanities to be invited to the table. I think we have a lot we have a lot to contribute to this, hmm. um, and this is you know, I mean, in a way, um, and I don't want. To say this and i'm some sort of a handboy to history so i'm simply like a good scribe to everything i have seen and i can write it in pretty language but i do think you know the way in which we see connections and the way we build build on to connections the way in which we create you know sort of critical matter which we call interpretation you know that gap between the 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 kind of you know the subject of enunciation and the world you know we are we are good about closing that gap so i really thought that in this in in this book um you know i could i could kind of say that look this is something uh, you know i'm part um kind of you know ethnographer primarily literary critic cultural critic um part you know cinema goer a part, you know, somebody who's suffering from incurable guilt about being born middle class, uh, you know, affluent uh, in India. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I brought all those aspects and probably because it's my third book, I was, you know, in, privileged enough to be able to take those risks. And I, I just want to say that the, it, this is a book for, you know, in a way, my the kind of a kind of Indianness, which I often forget about, came forth in the sense that, you know, what, what I saw with the free clinics in India was how incredibly minded they were toward the idea of rehabilitation. So, you know, one of the free clinics I talk about is called Samadhana, which means solution. And, and you know, the, there are elaborate case studies, but one of the first things that happens to a woman who's, you know, who's, whose maladies are associated with her incontinence as an adult, so she doesn't have this problem, but something happens in her adult life and she becomes very, very incontinent. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, the therapist, you know, takes a, through the vicissitudes of everything in her life that has led to that. But one of the first things the therapist says is that don't drink a lot of water before you have to travel. And this kind of you know, bloody mindedness is something I really love about because this is exactly what I mean, that treat this person as a human and treat, you know, do not talk down, but talk, you know, at kind of in a way, rehabilitate them into, into you know, kind of small talk. And, 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 and this is one of the ways in which you can, and of course that's not the, as we know that it's not as simple as that but the fact that it starts with that kind of a very kind of in a way manageable solution makes the patient feel that they are you know they, it'll make them feel there's an uncle or an, or an indian mother saying it don't drink so much water before you travel but it's kind of again not kind of pathologizing them but kind of in a way reintegrating them into certain social circuits and you know social uh, uh, kind of social behaviors and that's something i think that really i i connected to that bit of me and i saw that in the in the horticultural therapy uh, i saw that in the homeless shelter i worked with in new york that in a way, most of these sort of vigilante activists, they were extremely matter of fact and they're very solution minded. You know, one of them said to me, we don't, you know, analyzing the dream of the Red Bull, like it didn't go into the book. But, you know, and, um, um, they say we don't go into the childhood because there is no time. And I, I really love that. I, lo I love that, that we, we don't have time to go into childhood. A farmer has come spending very hard earned money uh, to buy uh, and buying a ticket to Bangalore from the neighboring village. And I just want them to have some sense. So the Red Bull is not about some Oedipal anxiety. The therapist says, do you think you're worried about your daughter's death where you have a uh, daughter's um, uh, sorry marriage where you have to pay dowry and the farmer says yes you know I'm, I'm worried about crop failures i'm worried about and 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 the problem goes away momentarily it'll probably come back again but it goes away momentarily because there's some sort of a provisional solution that is offered with a view to restoring him to capability and to his active life 
Thank you very much, Aki. Um, I'm going to um, just remind everyone, please do put your questions in the chat or put your hand up. Um, but in, in the meantime, um, I will pass back to Natalia and David. And do you want to um, carry on the conversation if you like? Um, maybe Natalia, if you want to go first. Sure, so I suppose, um, yeah, just another question about the your experience of actually sort of doing the research for this book and sort of doing empirical research as someone who's, who's trained as a literary critic. And I just wondered, um, yeah, how how did you prepare for that? Did you not prepare much at all? Because I think you know, in the book you, you talk very interestingly about the sort of improvisor, improvisatory nature of your research and you talked about it earlier as well. But you know, did, did you spend talking to social scientists, for example, or kind of um, habituating yourself in the sort of, the kind of codes and conventions of empirical work, I suppose is the question. That's a fantastic question. And yes, I mean, to some extent, you know, the closest discipline to the kind of the somewhat deranged thing I've done in Unseen, Unseen City is, of course, you know, um, uh, kind of medical anthropology or ethnography. And I did, did read a lot of those books, but I also, you know, what I did was when it went to the press, which is a very academic press, Cambridge University Press, um, I requested my editor uh, to uh, kind of, you know, try and give it to psychoanalysts. So the book was read by two psychoanalysts, uh, including uh, Neil Altman, who is actually a, a great sort of a, a hero of mine. He wrote a book called Analyst in the Inner City. So, and I really wanted them to pull me up for, in a way, places where the method had glitched or the method wasn't really, uh, you know, kind of, you know, very clear. Um, uh, I also kind of, you know, for a lot of the case studies, especially the ones that were, you know, there is a section on Nalam, which is a village uh, project, you know, that I, with the Banyan, it's a mental health charity in Chennai, I, I wrote up the case studies and then I made them reread re it because I just wanted to make absolutely sure I was capturing. And one of the things, as you know, um, uh, if you have uh, any kind of grant, you can't really interview psychosocially disabled people directly. So you have to do that through the mediation of, you know, the, an NGO, through psychotherapists, through social workers. And, and really, that was a fantastic learning curve for me, not just talking to, you know, the Western educated psychoanalysts and psychiatrists, but, you know, what in India are called the barefoot researchers, you know, people who are there, who are going into, who are coming out of the municipality, um, uh, kind of in the corporation system and they're volunteers and they are being trained by psychi psychiatrists to go back. And this is something, David, you mentioned, you know, the the idea of kind of no retribution. So they are trained in sort of non-judgmental listening and then they go there and, and they become, you know, the, this Indian psychoanalyst calls them vulnerable experts. And, and, and it was extraordinary for me to then interview them and learn about how tough their lives have been, which made them want to work in mental health in the first place. So, you know, I mean, th those were the tremendously interesting sort of like almost excursive uh, movements that the book book kind of, you know, allowed me to do, where I was not just kind of interacting with um, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who speak my language, but also with these community, the lay, you know, counselors who were um, and who were extremely, you know, who said that this is our livelihood, you know, we are not, they are not doing it for charity, they're doing it out of in that admixture of redressing certain social injustices they had felt themselves, but also, you know, because um, they were, they, they, they really felt that this is, you know, this is a, a kind of a wonderful way, they call it Monet Kotha, you know, this kind of almost this relay of um, of knowledge and and then they're so incredibly ingenious in 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 getting stories so you know if, if there is a woman who says she has some mental illness but the family is very conservative they they put leaflets through the door saying you know if these are your symptoms maybe this is what you have then they send somebody from the community into the woman's house a woman from that community into that woman's house and they have a little sort of kiosk on the terrace of the house and these kind of like you know thinking on the feet you're know, talking about tra traveling therapy thinking of the this ingeniousness through which some kind of cure is achieved. I mean, I just thought, you know, this is it. I call it, you know, this is in India, you have this word jugar. It just means, you know, these hacks. Uh, they're not cheating hacks, but in the absence of resources, you know, these hacks that you come up with. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I have the thought of the, the kiosk outside people's doors, the sort of big threshold. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Natalia. Um, David, over to you. Uh, oh, just uh, you just picking up on the hacks. I mean, 
what these vignettes about these free clinics were so wonderful because they showed you sort of people taking on the care of other people when there was no real infrastructure or resources to do it. And it is a side of psychoanalysis that actually gets underplayed in that. I remember you reminded me of a, there's a story about Isaiah Berlin going to visit Freud at the end of his life. And he goes to see the great man, the great sage with his special language. And he comes away saying, well, he was just like the doctors who I had when I was a kid. I'd go and see him. They'd just say practical, helpful things. And there is that side to psychoanalysis. Also, you've got to look after people's, the frame of their life, just the ordinary practical uh, details that show a kind of care before or as well as getting to the sort of complicated theoretical um, rarefied ideas. So to bring that picture of psychoanalysis back, which was there right from the start in Freud, is a really important thing to do. And to show it working successfully in, um, you know, as successful as people can do, um, given the, the conditions they're working under in these cases, in so many different contexts, um, is really inspiring because, you, you know, the, the, the question the book asks, I think, is, you know, if you took a lead from all these incidents across the world and thought, what if we built our social healthcare system? What if we built a mental healthcare system based on the, these kinds of practical things that work? What would, what would our system look like? It's a great question to ask. And thank you so much. And also, you know, I mean, this is the other this is the other meaning of of uh, psychoanalysis that it's, of course, you may understand it to have, a, you know, it's it's uh, traffic is with internal psychic conflict, but in the process, it also bestows, you know, interiority, you know, let talking about the dreams of the farmer who is unable to function, you know, I mean, again, that 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 cultivation of interior life. And that's something I think is extraordinarily important for the two you know kind of you know sides of unseen um that uh, uh and natalia mentioned that you know it's both kind of this obliviousness but also in kind of you know countries very very uneven and um a country such as india it's cultivated you know you you know i always give that example that you know you are given the sea view room but you know what no one tells you is that you really have to ignore the blue tarpaulin covered slum view before you're I hits the waves in 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 Mumbai, and and we are very good at that because you can't obviously function. Uh, you know, you can't eat if you see like all these hungry children clam clamoring around your car or, uh, you know, just outside the restaurant. So you know, this is and so you know, I mean, to some extent, I I really think that that cultivation of interior interiority, not thinking of poor populations as a collective, but also thinking about them individualized by this pathology is something I wanted to you know not kind of like, you know, really the mark of the plural. This is what Albert Memmi says, that people who have race, they have the mark of the plural, you know, they're all the same. And here it's, it's exactly the opposite of what I'm arguing. Thank you. Okay, there are two um, great questions actually in the chat and uh, one from Alec Burma. I apologize if I've got the pronunciation wrong, um, but apart from a, a, a lovely tribute to uh, the book itself, um, which I'll leave you to read, but she says, uh, to pursue a third, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the place of the city in the book. Have you discovered more about the city as a venue filter enabling or disabling place for psychoanalysis as a practice? Um, because uh, you also went to some rural areas in addition. So something about the city is... Yes, thank you very much, Alaka. These are wonderful uh, friends and faculty colleagues of mine. I mean, yes, I mean, that was kind of one of the very interesting um, kind of, um, I, I think, moments of reckoning for me that I would have to take a certain amount of thinking about the primitive and poor in the world and translate it to poor in the city, because there's a lot of thinking around the figure of the primitive and, you know, the um, in, in, in psychoanalysis. Um, and uh, I mean, the reason I chose the city was very matter of fact, really, because I did not want to, you know, I mean, you you cannot going from Oxford with straightened hair, you can't just jump into slums and start talking to, you know, people about mental illness, you have to go through experts and you have to take the right permission. So one of the key reasons I chose cities is because there are many, many, both public sector mental hospitals uh, um, uh, public sector mental health hospitals and also NGOs that work on poverty that, uh, you know, would give me the inroads into this. The other very 
important thing about the city is that, you know, I mean, of course, you know, New York, I mean, where I, I talk about the torture program at the Bellevue, I mean, of course, it could only happen in New York that, you know, you have uh, sort of, you know, escapees from from Bangladesh and some slaves from Mauritania and the Rohingyas assembled in a Bell in a New York hospital. So it is that kind of a, a kind of, you know, an, a, a, an asylum um, and, and, you know, to look at, again, the different ways in which torture in that sense torture and 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 that that temporal lag we associate with with trauma that you know trauma is never you know freud's model was kind of late, let's say a railway accident the railway spine that something happens to you you're on the railway for the first time you have a railway accident your body has never known this so you it takes you a little while to acknowledge what exactly has happened to you. So there's that temporal lag for people, you know, who've come with half of their arm chopped up in a civil war. Um, but there's also the, that element of unspeakability that you cannot talk about what happened to you because you are the, the state, the, the person who, the perpetrator is somebody who will murder you if you talk about it. So there are, the, there are these different ways in which the New York psychiatrist is having to then develop a panoply of psychotherapeutic methods to deal with not just the usual temporal lag of trauma, but, you know, these postcards coming from the dark places of the world, you know, where unspeakability has that other dimension. So the city was extremely, in a way, important. I mean, I, um, I do, I, I keep saying I'll never write a book like this because it was actually fairly physically exhausting, but I do want to write a book on Unseen Village as well. Uh, but I do think that the problems of mediation and translation will be even harder for me because I never for a second forget how deracinated I am. I'm now away from India for 30 years, you know, though I go back twice or thrice every year, but, you know, it's it's not the same thing. And and I, I do think that I definitely want to go there. And I did a little bit of that with Nalam. So city, because city is where I hide the psychiatrists and the psychoanalysts guiding me. City, because that's where the public sector mental hospitals are. City is also because, you know, you have these um, in, in the case of New York and London, I'm talking about migrant populations. So the, the migrant population at the torture center, migrant population at Tavistock. And finally, city also because in, in, in India, you know, the uh, the city is, you know, the 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 place of the slum, you know, this uh, so-called liminal space, which is actually everywhere. It's not liminal. It's everywhere. Uh, it's not, you know, the cities are kind of, of course, they are zoned, but, you know, Dharavi, the biggest slum, it's in the center of the city. It's not in the in the edges. And it's the very sector that provides the kind of informal labor uh, kind of, you know, late liberal, late capitalist economy needs, but it's the very sector that is the most ignored. And I mean, in my book, I've with both Catherine Boo's work and with the work of Pukar, I've talked about non-registered slums. So these are squatter slums. So they are even worse than slums. And you don't have these in cities. So, you know, the, to see this kind of resource deprivation where, so if it's a squatter slum, let's say somebody has occupied land belonging to the airport authority, then even the very basic, you know, governmental responsibilities of providing water or electricity are, are, are are not there, you know, you don't need to do anything for them. So you can just leave them to their to their resources. So the city was kind of very vital to um, what I was doing here. Thanks, thank you. And thank you very much, Annika. Um, a slight variation in, uh, from city versus rural to Lloyd Pratt's question, we just last for two minutes really. Um, and it's about sig significant national differences in the way that clinics or clinicians think about what constitutes a safe or safe enough space for good therapy to happen. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about that, thank you. I mean, with the with the activists, uh, thank you, Lloyd. Um, um, uh, wonderful. Both all all the questions have been wonderful. Um, one of the things that I'm saying is that there needs to be some sort of cultural or linguistic affinity for that safe space to be cultivated, especially with you know people who are brutalized by daily labor, brutalized by 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 years in a deeply xenophobic racist system that in a way the language you know really kind of you know opens things up you know if you look at my case studies of the turkish migrants for instance they're also happy that they're able to talk to their therapist who's a tavistock trained therapist in 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 kind of you know in their own language so um and not just that you know there is a there is a kind of in a way tagore uh quotation which means that in our 
degradation in our abjection we are all equal so that's the other thing that you know many of the people who work in the community they talk about how they have suffered from mental illness themselves so there is a that kind of leveling it's not the same thing at all of course for a middle class person to say i have the same problems as somebody you know who's um, kind of, you know, fled uh, um, a particular extremely genocidal regime. Um, but to say that, you know, I know what it is to be rendered so vulnerable and I had help and therefore I'm paying it forward. So I do think for that safe space to happen, there has to be that kind of a not top-down philanthropy, but that kind of almost a paratactic, not telescopic gesture toward creating equality to, towards saying that you know we are we are we have to activate these relays whether we call it transference or the the Bengali um, lay counselors call it monir kotha like heart to heart but that connection we need to sort of in a way open our hearts for that other heart to be able to correspond to us with you know some life giving beats. Thank you, Aki. We're really out of time but i just wanted to give um one last sort of a minute each to uh, natalia and david just just a sort of final thought on the book if you if you had to uh, have your comment on the back cover um just leave us leave leave us a thought on, well, there are plenty of glowing comments already by the way on the back cover but uh, a, a final 60 seconds from each of you will be great so I, I don't know who wants to go first uh, natalia do you want to go first um, sure. Yeah, just to say, I, I was really blown away by it, really. I, and I said in my um, brief comments, I was just so struck by, um, yeah, the kind of deafness with which Anki is able to kind of bring together these, these seemingly quite disparate materials and texts and discourses and make them speak together so well, uh, you know, from talking about the kind of metaphors used in sort of theoretical writing on psychoanalysis to sort of looking at entries in the in um, the DSM to the interviews she um, she does with practitioners of psychoanalysis. So I was just really impressed by that kind of bringing together various materials, and it yeah just reminded me of how how wonderful she is. Thanks, Natalia. David. Oh, and just you know my very brief comment on the back cover is you know this is the kind of psychoanalysis we need now. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's very much the flavour of. Uh, of the last hour, um, it is it is it has a, it is a wonderful book and a wonderful impact. So, um, with that, um, can I give you sixty seconds, Anki, that I must let people go and hand over to Julie? But uh, any, any final thought from you? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of really very, um, you know, there's there's a beautiful Rabindranath Tagore songs, and I was just thinking about it when we had this effulgence of the last two days. It says, akashe amar mukti aloi aloi. and then it goes on to say, amar mukti dhulai dhulai. So it first starts saying, my freedom is in the skies, my freedom is in this light. And then it says, my freedom is in the dust. And I really, really would like that kind of dust biting aspect of, of knowledge and education to come through that we've had our heads in the clouds for far too long. Let's try a little more of that of that dust biting, you know, that dhulai dhulai, that, you know, kind of really trying to suspend personality and privilege and trying to kind of, in a way, connect with these uh, other kind of modes of knowledge, which are not charity, which are not, uh, you know, sympathy or empathy, but which are much more hard won, you know, that connection you have with the suffering of somebody whose lives you cannot possibly imagine or understand. Thank you very much, Anki. Wonder, uh, Anki, a wonderfully uh, inspiring place to finish. Um, I'm going to thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, David, for taking the time for joining us to celebrate the launch of, of Anki's book. Uh, and I'm thank you above all to all alumni all over the all over the world for joining us uh, and for those who will watch this online in, in a slower time.